Hola a todos y bienvenidos un día más al canal Crónicas de una Merodeadora. Hoy estoy con Emily Barr. Welcome to my channel. Thank you. She's the author of The One Memory of Flora Banks, which I read last night. It's so good, guys. But since I haven't had the chance to talk to them about your book, uh -huh. please tell us a little bit about what it is. How did you come up with the idea? Sure. It's, um, it's a book about a girl who's 17 called Flora Banks. <laughs> surprisingly. Um, she has a, a form of amnesia called anterograde amnesia, which is no short-term memory, so she can remember things from before she got ill when she was 10, but anything since then, she forgets it very quickly, several times a day. So then one day, she kisses a boy on the beach, and she shouldn't really because he's her friend's boyfriend, um, but then she remembers it, so this is her one memory, it stays in her mind, and that changes everything for her. He's gone off he goes, has to go off to study in Svalbard in Arctic Norway and she thinks if she can find him he's got the key to solving her memory so she has to see whether she can get away from her very, very tightly controlled life in, in England and get herself off to the Arctic to try and, to try and find him and see if that will change her life. Which it's quite a journey. <laughs> it really is, yes. Yeah, so long. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I read that you, before writing Flora Banks, you were an adult writer. I was, yeah. yeah. Why did you like jump from adults to young adults? It was the, this book, really. I started, I was supposed to be writing a completely different book for my then publishers, for my adult books, yeah. and I just, I actually, I had a dream, I literally had a dream of this book. Okay. And I woke up in the morning with this book in my head of snow, midnight sun, because when she goes to the Arctic, it's um, it, the sun shines all the time, day and night. Yeah. Um, it's and <laughs> yes, it is. It is if you're really there as well. Really and, and this confused girl with no memory walking around there. And that was in my dream, and it just stayed in my head, and I thought, I really want to write this book. So I, I tried to write it as an adult book, yeah. which is what I had a publisher for. Yeah, that would have been so much easier, but it just didn't quite work. And then I, I thought, I'll try it as a young adult, and changed it, rewrote it, and it just all fell into place. So it, it kind of was the book that changed it for me. But then I discovered how wonderful it is writing young adult books, and so that's, that's what I do now. How does the interactions change between your adult target public and the young adult public? So different. It's amazing, this whole world of young adults is a thing that um, I didn't really know about. I, I did read young adult books because I really enjoyed them beforehand, but I didn't know that there's such a community out there, isn't there? It's, the interaction is, it comes from Instagram, yeah. Twitter, um, you know, all over the place. Whereas with my adult readers, I would sometimes hear from them on Twitter or by email through my website, and that's it. So it's, it's very different also. I think young adult readers are much more likely to, to write a review on their blog or whatever and, and link you to it. So I see far more good and bad um, reactions to what I write. Yeah, right. Um, I'm always curious about this. Are you the kind of writer that plans everything ahead or do you just let it flow? I mean, this book came from a dream, so it works. <laughs> um, a real mixture of the two, actually. I think if you start writing without a plan, you can end up having to delete so many words and so <laughs> and rewrite and rewrite it could just rear off into, into the wrong place so I try to have a plan but I think the most fun part is when you're just writing and seeing what happens so I have I like to know where it's going to end but anything that happens between the beginning and it's that a point it's a surprise <laughs> and they, it can be very surprising sometimes but I do feel I feel quite insecure with the story if I don't know how it's going to end yeah. King of Praise Yes, <laughs> yes, okay. anything can happen, I can't do oh, it. You <laughs> well, as you said before, this book deals with a very serious issue that is amnesia. Yeah. How did you manage to write it so truthfully? I mean, it was like there. <laughs> oh, thank you. I, I did lots of research about it and I, I read a lot of scientific papers. I wanted to, for a long time, I thought it would be really interesting to write about amnesia because it's, it's just a really interesting thing. And then I thought, that happens in Hollywood all the time, you know, yeah. someone gets a bang on the head, they forget, they get another one, they remember, so I thought, that's a bit cliche. Mm -hmm. And then it just felt like this book, it needed to be in this book, so I thought, I'd better do it right, so I did lots of reading, I have 
an old friend from university who's a doctor in that area, so I asked him for advice. And, and then when it came to the actual writing of it, just so much rewriting and editing. Even right towards the end, I'd, I'd be like, uh, proofreading it and I'd be like, she can't remember, she's remembering something she shouldn't oh, be able to remember, okay. <laughs> change it. There's so, so much of that. Yeah, that's the thing, like, Flora only remembers like three hours prior and then yeah. she forgets. Yes. Um, it can tend to be like a little repetitive for her. Yeah. But it's not for readers. How do good. You do that? <laughs> um, lots of rewriting. I'm glad you say that because yeah. I was. But even after the book was finished, there was a part of me thinking, is that it's it's quite unusual yeah. to. She has to remember. As a reader, you see her remembering things yeah. quite often. So I, I still thought, is it, is it too repetitive? I don't know. But I think I tried to make it so that every time she remembers, she remembers something different. Well, there's something different. There's something that reader knows that she doesn't know, or, or there's something new in there. So every time, hopefully, there's, there's, um, there's something that, that makes that repetition still interesting. Yeah, well, it's definitely hooked. <laughs> Good, thank you. Well, how hard was for you to write from Flora's point of view? Like, it's hard for me to read from her point yeah. of view. Who was writing it? it? It was great, actually. Once I got into it and I'd got her voice sounding how I wanted it yeah. to, then um, it just, it, it was lovely, it was a really nice way to write, it was, it, it did take a lot of rewriting, but actually recently I had to write some extra chapters for oh. the US oh. paperback yeah. edition, they wanted some, like, an extra Extra. chapter, so I had to go back to it after a couple of years and write another chapter. And I found like I was just straight away. I was like, Oh, oh Flora, that's hi. lovely. <laughs> this is how I like to write. So, okay. um, so besides Flora, which was the most difficult character to portray on page? I think the character Jacob, her brother, yeah, because you don't. He's he's very important to her life. And I think he's my favourite character, actually. Okay. Um, but as a reader, you never actually see him on the page. So I, so everything, he was coming through emails and letters. So that was quite difficult, because I had a very clear sense of who he was yeah. and who he was to her. But we never see him, because he's ill. Um, he exists in her memories from before she was 10, and then he exists in letters and emails. So that's, that's a very unusual way to portray yeah. a character. But I love him. And oh, speaking of Jacob, <laughs> I was about to tell you, like, there was a, there were so many times in which my heart absolutely broke oh, while <laughs> reading it. One of them was Jacob's last letter. I mean, yeah. it's <laughs> devastating. So, was there a moment when you were writing that you said, okay, I have to stop because I'm overwhelmed by all these feelings? <laughs> yes, I did. Get, I got really overwhelmed by Jacob's, yeah. uh, Jacob's end story. Um, he is very ill, and I didn't want to leave. I mean, it, it's a sad way to leave it still. One thing I, I'm thinking about doing, and I haven't really said this to anybody else, is writing a prequel to it. So it's like Jacob's story from the very beginning, so from when he's 15, to, to kind of tell his own story. Yeah. Because I'd really like to go back to... It's an interesting character because, like, because of his sexuality, his circumstances, he's going away from home, everything. Like, I'd love to read yeah. that. So, well, I, I might write that next. Okay. Um, well, there's one guy um, who may, well, who people may think he's the villain, uh -huh. but I couldn't help but absolutely hate Flora's mother because of what <laughs> she does, yeah. and her father because he never stands up to yeah, her. Yes, he does nothing. How do you feel about them? Well, I, I'm a mother, and I, I feel probably more sympathy to Flora's mother than you do, because she feels so responsible for Flora, and all she wants to do is keep her safe, and she obviously overdoes it yeah. massively and just at the beginning of the book she's living as if she was still a 10 year old she's yeah. nothing she does is completely constrained by her mother because her mother just wants nothing bad ever to happen to her again and so it's in a way the book's the story of her breaking out of that and so I, I I do feel sympathy for her mother but I think we we only see her from how her actions yeah. affect, affect Flora it, it's tough yes yeah I, I know I shouldn't <laughs> but I can't help That's okay. It, so. You can. <laughs> well, and on the other stream, I couldn't help but absolutely love all the people in Svalbard. Oh, yes. Svalbard, I don't yes. know how to yes. pronounce Svalbard it. Svalbard is exactly. Like, Aggie, 
And Toby. Yes. Are like such guardian angels for uh, Flora while she's there. Like, how did you come up with the idea of them? Are they inspired in some people you know, or you just wanted them to be like so nice? I just wanted them to be nice. I, I did. I thought it would be too hard for Flora to get away and then find like the world is a horrible place. And also, Svalbard is a wonderful place to visit, and I felt like there would be people looking out for her. Yeah. Aggie, I think when I I went to Svalbard to to. Oh, I wrote the book and when I started writing the book just to, to check if the winter was that bad. Exactly, just to check what it was really like. And I went on the boat trip that Flora does at one point while she's there. And while I was there, I was chatting to someone who was, she was like the very beginning of the character of Aggie. She was an Australian blogger and she was on, on her own, just completely fearless, just, just travelling around writing this stuff. And, and then I thought it would be more interesting if she was finished as she turned out yeah. to be. And it's so lovely. <laughs> so did you see polar bears being there? Yes, yes. actually, well, from so the boat, luckily, far away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I saw them through my, my camera zoom, oh, <laughs> which was good, best place to go over Yeah, that's, really, that's one of Flora's rule, rules for life, yes. right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Away from polar bears. <laughs> so, um, this book is quite tragic, <laughs> despite like the silver lining we see at the end. Yes. Are all your books like that? Are you to tragic stories? They're not all tragic, they, they are all quite dark, I think. Yeah. Everybody's got a bit of darkness in them and I think that's a really interesting thing yeah. to explore in fiction. Flora's life motto is to be brave, yes. in time, in spite of all, everything that she's living. But why do you think you have to be brave even when everything's falling apart? And I think that's all we can do really. I think everybody, everybody struggles with things and all you can do when if it feels like everything's falling apart, you can fall apart with it, um, or you can just push like, through. Right, there'll, there'll be something. Well, like, I think this could be, but I have to geek out here. I just read on your Twitter, you're a champion speller of <laughs> Harry Potter words. I am. <laughs> How come? Like, do you <laughs> love that saga as much as I do? <laughs> I, I do love Harry Potter, yes, I do, and I have children who do as well, so oh. I've read them many times. Yes. And the spelling of the words was because I did a book festival in Dublin last yeah. year um, called Deathcon and beforehand I had a message from my editor in Dublin saying do you want to do a Harry Potter spelling thing? So I was like yeah sure I did. Why not? But I hadn't realised it was, they had ten authors, a theatre packed with people wow. and it was a really, I just imagined like just write some things down um, <laughs> but it was really really formal. So yeah, yeah we got through a few rounds we were like oh, I'm still doing okay and then I saw the prizes which was so much Harry Potter stuff and I was like right I'm gonna win this because I'm gonna take that home for yeah. my kids. <laughs> so yeah I did it. How oh, cool! <laughs> which was the last word you spelled? It might have been Sectum Sectra. Well um, just to finish like this interview going back to floor banks, would you tell my readers to please be brave and read your book? Yes! <laughs> Be brave, whatever the problem is going on in your life, whatever's happening, be brave, it makes it better. And um, do read this book. Well, thank you so much for being here.